Good afternoon, everyone. We have over 400 participants. Uh, and welcome to uh, this event, Black and Jewish Intersections of Blacks and Jewish Identity in American Culture, Politics, and Religious Life Today. Um, my name is David Stern. I'm the Harry Starr Professor of Classical and Modern Hebrew and Jewish Literature here at Harvard and director of our Center for Jewish Studies. And on behalf of the Center and the Hutchins Center for African and African-American Research, I wanna welcome you to this program. Uh, the program is sponsored, co-sponsored by the Center for Jewish Studies and the Hutchins Center, and specifically by the Joseph Engel Fund of the Center. Uh, this is the first of several programs we're going to be having during the semester. And I hope you'll join us for the others. Details about those programs will be shared with you later on. Uh, I wanna begin simply by thanking uh, the people who have worked tirelessly to arrange this program. Uh, first of all, my colleague, uh, Henry Louis Gates, uh, professor of African-American studies and the director of the uh, Hutchins Center uh, Abby Wolf, executive director of the Hutchins Centers, uh, uh, Rachel Rockenmacher and Sandy Kantav, the two administrators of the Center for Jewish Studies, and Matthew Weinberg and Justin Snide, the events team at the Hutchins Center. Um, and I especially want to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Sarah Feldman, preceptor in Yiddish, and Professor uh, Saul Zaret, Associate Professor of Yiddish and Modern Jewish Literature, who really, whose inspiration really created this program. It was their idea, and, uh, and they really worked to create this entire series with the Hutchins Center. And we're very excited about this program. It really fills a, uh, a lacuna in the current discussion today, this extremely important discussion at this moment in American and American Jewish and black history. Uh, so we're really excited about being able to uh, host this discussion in this series here at Harvard and to share it with you. Uh, I'm gonna hold, hand the program over now to Dr. Feldman and she'll introduce our speakers and tell you more about the entire series. So, Sarah. Thank you, David, so much. Um, and I wanna, again, thank Saul and Abby and Justin and Matt and Rachel and Sandy, who really put, I think, an extraordinary amount of care and dedication to this project that means a lot to all of us. We wanna do something different um, and broaden the discussions of black identities and Jewish identities and see about the many ways these identities intersect rather than just talking about a binary of black versus Jewish. Um, and each of the extraordinary people that we have invited to speak brings their own individual experiences and perspectives to this conversation. Um, we will have two more events in this series coming up this semester. I hope you will join us for a conversation with culinary historian Michael Twitty in March in a panel of remarkable Black and Jewish social justice activists on April 19th. Um, a point of information, we had hoped to have Professor Katya gibel Mubarak here, the author of Black, Jewish, and Interracial it's not the color of your skin, but the race of your kin and other myths of identity. Um, we'd hope to have her contributions today, um, but unfortunately, she's not able to join us. Um, and as for how this event is going to work, only the speakers will have working mics and we will begin this conversation, which will conclude at 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., we will have a Q&A session the way to submit a question is to click it into the Q&A tab. The chat is going to be closed and Abby Wolf from the Hutchins Center will share your questions with the panelists. So I'm really glad to be here today with our panelists. 
but I want to pause for a moment to reflect on the fact that as we meet here today to talk about Black and Jewish identity, people around the country are still grieving the recent passing of Karen Lewis, the former president of the Chicago Teachers Union, who was Black and Jewish. We had hoped to invite her to participate in this series, for which I can personally say she was a big inspiration. She was perhaps the greatest, most influential, and most beloved labor leader of our time, of the 21st century. She was an important civil rights activist, and she would likely have been elected mayor of Chicago if she had not fallen ill several years ago. The legacy of her visionary, solidarity-based organizing strategy can be seen across the country from West Virginia to Los Angeles. Um, and the people that we have to, here today are also extraordinary individuals that we've been really eager to bring to Harvard, although they both, I would like to say, have a connection with Harvard already. So welcome back, Rebecca Pierce and Anthony Russell. I'll tell everyone a little bit about them. Um, Rebecca Pierce is a writer and filmmaker based in San Francisco. Her multimedia storytelling covers a diverse range of topics, including race, religion, global conflict, and human rights. She has a BA in film and digital media from UC Santa Cruz, and she was an affiliate fellow at Harvard's Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative. Rebecca's work as a filmmaker has taken her around the world with projects shot in the Middle East, Asia Pacific region, Europe, and the United States. Her editorial writing and much sought public speaking on racial justice issues affecting African American and Jewish communities has been featured by The Nation, The New Republic, Jewish Currents, The Forward, and NPR's All Things Considered. In 2019, JTA listed her as one of 50 Jews to follow, and she was named one of 40 women to watch by The Tempest Magazine. She's also a filmmaker in residence at the Jewish Film Institute and a Wallace Annenberg Helix Fellow. Welcome back. Um, and our second guest is Anthony Russell. After a previous career as an operatic vocalist, Anthony is now a vocalist, composer, and arranger specializing in music in the Yiddish language. His work in traditional Ashkenazi Jewish musical forms led to a musical exploration of his own ethnic roots through the research, arrangement, and performance of 100 years of African-American roots music, which resulted in his album Convergence, a collaboration with klezmer consort Beretsky Pass, exploring the sounds and themes of 100 years of African-American and Ashkenazi Jewish music. Inspired by an ethnographic fellowship, culminating in a trip to Belarus and Poland, Anthony formed a duo, Svebrider, two brothers, with accordionist and pianist Dmitry Gaskin for the composition and performance of original music set to modernist Yiddish poetry of the 20th century. Through lines, recurring themes, and obsessions of Anthony's work are cultural production, the formation and development of diasporic identity, ethnic spiritualities, conversations between authentic folk culture and urbanity, the cabaret art form, and formal continuities between traditional culture and queer identity. An essayist in a number of publications, including Jewish Currents and Moment Magazine, Anthony lives in Massachusetts with his husband of five years, Rabbi Michael Rothbaum. He is also regularly invited to speak and sing to the students of Harvard Yiddish Studies classes. So welcome back to Harvard, both of you. And it's, it's wonderful to have you here. And I know that all of the people out there zooming in are in for a really interesting conversation. Um, so let's get started. We've talked, you've both talked about how your creative work um, is generative of a Black and Jewish identity that breaks the binary or the assumption that people have that this is a binary opposition. And I would like for you to tell us a little bit about your work and how it accomplishes that. 
Uh, I'd like to say that lately my work as a performer, um, composer, and a writer has been the elucidation of expressive continuities between my identity as a Black queer man and the performative contents of Black and Jewish culture. Um, it allows me to be conversant in different ways of being in the world that are often separated and essentialized into binaries outside of myself, but internally are as much a part of me as any other sort of foundational element. So I've um, worked to try to find ways to do this through text as a writer, to do this through the combination of Black and Jewish text historically, um, and as a musician, um, trying to sort of establish my own black Jewish idiom that, uh, for me, makes sense in, in both particular contexts. And I think for me, a lot of my filmmaking is rooted in, um, first of all, a legacy of documentary filmmaking about social movements um, in which, you know, uh, I was always sort of focusing on the shared histories of black and Jewish communities, um, whether it be, you know, one film that was very like uh, influential for me was Cicero March, which was a film about, um, you know, a very like very tay film about a protest against housing discrimination in Illinois, where um, both the black and Jewish sides of my family are from. And um, that style of filmmaking is really infor informing my current work um, about African asylum seekers in Israel. And that um, uh, sort of project came out of me traveling to Israel and Palestine with an all black delegation and meeting with a lot of different communities there, um, whether it be Palestinian refugees in the Haitian refugee camp or um, members of the Israeli Black Panther Party, uh, a Mizrahi Jewish movement, um, Ethiopian Israelis, and then also this group of um, incarcerated African asylum seekers who are not Jewish or um, Palestinian, but sort of live in this liminal space of having no status in a a region we understand outside of it as usually being you know centered around political religious conflict and so for me um you know my work as a filmmaker in the solidarity that i'm practicing in that filmmaking is really about bringing these two for me very like um connected parts of who i am together so like as a jewish person i feel a responsibility towards african asylum seekers in israel because they're being denied rights in a state that purports to protect my own at the same time as a black person um, I'm, I believe in Pan-Africanism and um, spending a lot of time with folks from Eritrea and Sudan who are living in Israel now, learning about their social movements. Um, we see so much connections between how they organize and fight for their own rights and how Black folks in the U.S. are. Specifically, Black Lives Matter is a very strong point of um, connection. So for me, um, my work when I'm writing about Black and Jewish issues in the U.S. is connected to this as well and trying to sort of um, break down these notions that these are two discrete communities, the black community and the Jewish community with two discrete sets of you know, needs and interests and really trying to understand the ways that they intersect, the ways that they come into conflict and the way that you know, people like myself and also Anthony are already sort of walking in between these spaces. And it's not a contradiction. In fact, it's just how we live our lives. Um, thank you. So, so you brought up one of the issues that's kind of at the core of what we're trying to do um, by having you here is to think about is uh, there are so many events and conversations about black Jewish relations as if um, ignoring the existence of people who are both black and Jewish and you've talked about the Jewish part of yourself and the black part of yourself and the whole of yourself and having both of those identities. Um, maybe for some of our listeners, can you tell us a little bit about ways in which you've been able to articulate a, a holistic identity, that, which is in fact what you live? In, in many ways for me that has taken place by expressly trying to sort of sift through the contents of what the uh, Black Jewish relations paradigm was in order to pull out what are real affinities between these um, often expressed as monolithic groups of people to find actually a real basis of solidarity as opposed to investing in communal narratives that unfortunately do the thinking for us. So um, 
that's usually how I, I deal with the fact that this uh, black Jewish relations paradigm is so firmly established um, in the minds of, of both communities and takes up so much space in, in discussions of, of black Jewish existence. Um, it's something that I really sort of, sort of try to eschew because there's so many sort of complicated dynamics involved in it. One of the ones that I'm um, the least fond of, I would say, is a certain kind of um, rhetoric of, um, I'm trying to think of the right word to describe this, a sort of uh, rhetoric of Black indebtedness to Jewish people because of a history of Jewish people being very firmly involved in the civil rights movement. Oftentimes what I'm trying to do is advocate for um, the memory of the particular individuals who actually put their body on the line as Jewish individuals, as opposed to um, a monolithic group of Jewish people who supposedly aided in the civil rights movement. Um, so, I, you know, in a sense, by establishing myself as a Black Jewish individual, I'm also inviting other people to also remember the other individuals who did this kind of work, both as Black people and as Jewish people. Um, so there isn't this sort of rhetoric of indebtedness, which often comes into a conversation um, about Black Jewish relations. And I think I'm similarly always having to sort of respond to that. And I'm sort of known for, for making these interventions. Like in the Jewish community, I'll be addressing anti-Black racism. Um, I'm also involved in a lot of like conversations in the Black community when issues of anti-Semitism come up. But for me, the, the place that I'm most at ease and comfortable and have to do sort of like the least explaining is when I'm in community with other Black Jewish people. Um, and often that's kind of happening behind closed doors or we're, we're sort of private about our spaces, but um, they are really special to us. It's actually how I know Anthony from before this event is in, in sharing these spaces. One thing that really sticks out to me was the Jews of color convening in New York City a few years ago where um, we were, there was just this total freedom of not having to explain or work through other people's hangups about being both of these things. And from that, we've seen a ton of new, you know, organizing, writing, art, thinking um, in the Jewish community. And it's really, it's really shifted a lot. And so for me, that's where I ground a lot of, I'm trying to ground a lot of my um, work and advocacy. And also I think it's just important, to, um, you know, to always hold that ground of, I'm not, caught between I'm both and that's fine and I think um like in this moment now where it's actually become quite difficult in some cases to be public about you know any every single black Jewish person I know who's a public figure speaking out on issues of race in the Jewish community has to deal with very intense anti-black racism and similarly when I you know I don't want to make a one-to-one -one comparison because it's really not the same and frankly I, I have less issues being Jewish in the black community than I do being black in the Jewish community but it can also be very tough when issues you know, in the media, like, um, are being brought up in a way that pits our communities together to be that minority religious voice in a, in a community that's you know, majority Christian, um, trying to sort of square these things. So for me, it's just important to, to make it clear that there's nothing that I'm giving up about myself when I'm talking about one thing or the other, when I'm addressing Nick Cannon <laughs> being a little problematic and arrogant, in my opinion, um, and when he made, you know, comments about who Jewish people are and are not, um, I'm saying that as a black woman who has, who's impacted because I'm part of that community, not because I'm a Jewish person making an intervention in another community. The curious thing is that it's often assumed that we would have some sort of insight into this um, phenomenon of, of black antisemitism, which I already have an issue with as a concept because um, it it um, in, endows black people with an almost an innate um, nature of, of anti-Semitism that they somehow have to exercise um, in public in order for it to be properly dealt with. And it's very hard sometimes being a black person in Jewish community because the assumption is that you have some sort of insight into um, this innate state of anti-Semitism that supposedly exists among black people. I'm not going to pretend that there aren't patterns of anti-Semitic thinking in portions of the Black community, but um, this concept of a, you know, a monolithic Black anti-Semitism is, is not something that I, I have um, experience of or have really, really seen. I don't think anti-Semitism is innate to, to the Black existence any more than I think that anti-Black racism is innate to the Jewish existence. 
Um, so we've just touched on on a, a piece of of what we talked about yesterday that that maybe we can briefly revisit today, which is the role of institutions or your place in institutions, whether they be Jewish institutions that are not black or black institutions that are not Jewish, or perhaps institutions that are Jew of, Jews of color institutions. What kind of institutions do you have in mind and, and what is your experience with them? Um, I can I can start on this one. I have a lot of experience working in in left wing Jewish uh, institutions, trying to address issues of like Jews of color representation and sort of like white hegemony. Um, and and as I've sort of moved um, you know more like into more I guess mainstream Jewish spaces, I'm also starting to address things like this. And uh, when the uh, Black Lives Matter protests were happening last summer, one piece I wrote was about. Um, how Jewish institutions in the US often function similarly to what we refer to as white space, um, where the people where people of color are not expected to be and are sort of policed upon entry. And I think it's really difficult um, for people who have not had that experience to understand what it is to be a black person showing up in a synagogue um, and you know, looking different or having a different cultural approach um, and being responded to as if you don't belong there. And so that's something I've, I've been writing about. And I think many, you know, I'm also working closely with a lot of Jewish institutions trying to change these things. Uh, I'm a member of a reform congregation here in the Bay Area that is doing a racial justice and um, equity and inclusion process. And, um, you know, I'm part of that. And seeing the sort of how pe willing people are to embrace that is actually very heartening, but also there's a lot of resistance to it. And some of that comes from this idea that the concerns of Black people are not the concerns of the Jewish community. Um, and that is something that we've had to battle this whole time and, and sort of justify, why do you even matter? You know, I think people kind of have that, they, they don't really want to admit that that's the question they're asking, but when people say like, what, what does Jews of color have to do with me? Um, or why does my institution or my space be, like have to include them? Um, that's sort of like the 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 um, subtext of what's going on, and I think talking about the black community, I think there's a different. You can't just sort of take the the Jewish communal institutional framework and like place that on the black community, um, but there is a complexity to being Jewish in the black community. We're like very you know Christian oriented. A lot of my um, black family is Christian, although many are also Muslim. Um, but the, the assumption of, of Christianity as a baseline is also something that we have, that we run into a lot. And like similar to what Anthony was just saying, I don't think that there is specifically black anti-Semitism alone, but I do think that there is a sort of Christian hegemony that can pop up where the ideas about Jewish people that you'll hear in the black community are the same sort of ideals that you'll hear, unfortunately, from Christian white supremacists, ideas of us having inordinate control or um, being, you know, somehow the uh, you know, false Jewish people, as we've heard, um, there's like a controversy this week with a, a conservative black speaker who made that made that comment, um, and really it boils down to sort of, um, you know, a the like early theology that presented Jews as having given up the covenant by not following Jesus Christ and thus becoming like false holders of the covenant, right? And that's not something that's just in the black community, but it is something that like we have to contend with, right? But fortunately. Um, Jews are Jew, black Jews are not the only people who are contending with Christian hegemony in the black community. You have a lot of queer folks, atheists, Muslims, other people of other religious backgrounds, um, sort of wrestling with this. And so I feel like a, a big part of my work is actually finding connection with those communities and also Christians who are, you know, seeking to sort of like unpack this and have a different kind of relationship with Jewish people. And um, there is a lot of work to be done and that's being done that's sort of rarely talked about that is trying to address this but again it's not some of it is happening within the black church but it's also happening in other spaces shared spaces art spaces theater spaces um that i'm lucky enough to be part of considerations around institutions in the jewish context are often very complicated to address because there are so many mainstream jewish organizations which are still trying to develop exactly what the function of the person of color is in relationship to them as an organization. Um, and that's been even more the, uh, the case over the past year, um, you know, since the Black Lives Matter movement has become uh, an object of national attention and now Jewish communal attention. So it, it's a complicated question, especially as it relates to Black Jews and especially as it's related to me as a Black Jew. Um, 
When it comes to institutions as far as Black people are concerned, it's also very complicated because the concept of a Black institution in an American context is, is a complicated thing. Um, the history of America has generally been um, the undermining, if not the outright destruction of Black institutions, um, starting with the family and going on from there. Um, I do consider myself to sort of be, uh, at least familiarly, um, by virtue of family, sort of a product of certain Black institutions. Um, I do consider myself to be to some degree an exponent of the Black church because my maternal family is very sort of strongly um, aligned with the Black church, specifically um, the Church of Christ in Texas. Um, far back in my family, um, a, a particular ancestor actually brought that, that um, denomination to the African-American community of Texas sometime in the 19th century. Um, the way that that sort of is related to my identity as a Jewish person, though, is that I, I hold the fact that I've come from a very long line of religiously oriented people, and I am just merely the next version of that who, who happens to be Jewish. Um, I'll, it also sort of um, exists in me as an inspiration of a minority spirituality um, that exists um, in resistance, um, as it were, to kind of white hegemonic Christian identity. And that fits in very directly with, with my identity as a Black Jew as well. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear more, and I think, I think a lot of other people will be too, about resistance and historical resistance to hegemony. Um, and maybe before we start looking back in history, I just want to pause for a second to, to the, um, the term Jews of color and the significance of Jews of color spaces. So first of all, um, certainly not everybody uh, who is a person of color who is Jewish um, prefers to be identified as a Jew of color. It's not an uncontroversial term. And some of the ways that, um, some of the objections that have been raised have to do with, that, it, that perhaps it includes an implicit assumption that the rest of Jewish identity is to be white. Um, and I would like to hear more about the importance of this term to you and how do you understand its use and also what in the 21st century, uh, what has maybe changed as a black and Jewish person compared to what it might have been historically for others? Well, Jews of color originated as far as I, I can tell from my own research and understanding as an organizing term um, and generally started being coming into use in the 90s. Um, and I know um, Shahana McKinney Baldwin, who is a great um, organizer, Black Jewish organizer in Wisconsin, um, wrote a forward of a book that had that in the title and was one of the first sort of people to, to, to use it. And it was really, um, you know, Jewish people of many different backgrounds who experience, you know, racial otherness within the Jewish community, finding an umbrella term to use it in an organizing sense. And it's similar to people of color and that it was created, you know, by Black feminists. Um, to, to, to describe a certain um, framework or analytic for organizing, right? Um, and it was in opposition to European sort of hegemony in the Jewish community and the sort of assumption that to be Jewish is to be European. Um, it doesn't mean that it's actually accepting that assumption um, wholly. It's, it's actually sort of saying like, this is how we who are excluded from that um, choose to like operate in a, in a society where that is something that's sort of being that we're being subjected to you know and I think um I understand that like terms change and also like now you'll hear people calling themselves like um black indigenous uh Jews of color right um and it's sort of adopting different changing languages our movements change and our ways of describing each other change but for, for me it's a useful term because 
I do feel that I have common cause with other people who may not necessarily like be the exact same identity as me, but who experience racial marginalization in the Jewish community. And especially at a time when a lot of um, Jews who do not have a like POC background are really struggling to like deal with the issue of white supremacy, whether or not they align themselves with whiteness or not, or how they feel about that. It is really important for us to be able to stake out a claim of like who we are in this conversation, because quite often the attempts to sort of like back away from responsibility for white supremacy end up, you know, like, like claims that all Jews have a singular racial identity. Um, that's not true. That was not my experience growing up, um, you know, in a family where some of the people were white and some of the people were black and the white people happen to be Jewish, right? Um, so for me, it's an important term. I don't think it's going to be the end all only way to describe myself um, or like, um, you know, a, a stagnant identity that I'm stuck in, but it is um, something that's useful for me for describing the world I live in and, and how I move through it. I think the term Jews of color allows us, allows people who identify as Jews of colors and even people who don't to actually acknowledge the very real diversity of the Jewish people in a way that acknowledges it, but does not use it defensively against charges of racism coming out of portions of, of the Jewish community. It actually acknowledges the diversity that's actually there. Um, so how, how do you think things have changed over time? Does the internet make it easier to create Jews of color spaces? What might be different in your generation? I mean, I guess the miracle of the internet in one way or another is the fact that it is a place where it is easy to find and to create community. Um, and to make oneself visible in a way that one was not before. And I think that has really been a boon to uh, the community of Jews of color in the United States and abroad over the past 10 years. It's been amazing to see um, all these people coming together and finding all of these things in common and finding all of the solidarity that was just there um, already in, in various Jewish communities, but had never really been brought together into one place. Yeah, and I think especially for, uh, I know me and Anthony are both on Twitter, <laughs> um, that's been like one site where it's a place where you can sort of suss out your ideas, you know, um, try out new things, meet like-minded people. It's also a place where we're exposed to a lot of vitriol and, um, you know, the kind of backlash to people like us uh, being out there in the world. But um, yeah, I do think that this generation is sort of in a place where we can sort of check notes more easily. Like, oh, you had this experience. I also had this experience. Um, what did you do about it? What can I do about my situation? Um, how do we articulate what it is that we're, that's happening? And I think that that's sort of created a little bit, you know, it hasn't brought us all together like Kumbaya as a, like a single unit, but it has created, the, you know, this community within a community that and is in between these different communities like if you're the only black person in your synagogue um now there's a way for you to know many other black people maybe not in your town but maybe the next town over maybe within your state maybe within your country and i think that that really has sort of changed how we conceptualize ourselves because i know when i first started thinking about these things i sort of thought of myself as like the the lone one and um the the sooner that i was able to sort of like let go of that idea and think of myself as part of actually like a communal body of black Jewish people. Um, it was this incredibly liberating thing and that allows me to um, just move with so much more freedom knowing that. Well, just maybe briefly while we're thinking about Jews of color spaces um, and, and, and the term, I know this isn't exactly our topic for today, but, but I think it's maybe important. What, what kinds of people, what kinds of identities fall under this umbrella? What kinds of people are in these communities that are Jews of color? What is the diversity that you see represented? Its contents are various. Um, I think in an American context, um, it, it is sort of expresses itself as um, in some ways as um, a group of people who have felt left out of a mainstream white Ashkenazi oriented uh, uh, American experience. Um, 
But the interesting thing is that the contents of, of those people who have been left out often includes people whose heritage comes from Ashkenazi Jewishness. So it's, it's very complicated. The spaces really create themselves by, by virtue of affinity. Um, that means it's also included um, Sephardic Jews. It means it's included Mizrahi Jews. It means it's included um, Jews who have felt really othered by the establishment of a monolithic American mainstream Jewish identity. And I think speaking from the position of having tried some transnational Jews of color organizing, which is like very complex, um, you know, even the term itself doesn't always translate. When I first was working on my Israeli Black, Black Panther documentary dealing with uh, Mizrahi Jews in Jerusalem, um, I remember we had to sort of explain what Jews of color were to Reuven Abergel, who's the, the subject of that documentary, by saying like Jews who are not white in Hebrew, because that's just not a term, it, like, or wasn't a term at that point in Israel. And Reuven, um, he works with Ethiopian Israelis. He's also been like very vocal on Palestine solidarity, also very vocal on supporting African asylum seekers in Israel. Um, he's really sort of like moving between these communities and he, he wasn't familiar with that term. So he sort of had to like slow down a little bit and be like, so we're doing something similar to what you're doing, which is this intercommunal um, organizing across these different you know, Jewish um, communities. Uh, and this is how we sort of conceptualize that. And I think one of the challenges of also doing this in the US, and um, for me, this is like working in the, the JVP Jews of Color, Sephardi Mizrahi Caucus, which no longer exists, but um, has sort of evolved into other spaces. Um, you know, even just calling ourselves justice, a Jews of color space didn't hold all of the room for all the different kinds of marginalizations that we were realizing we had to address. Like there were Sephardic people in the room who were sort of excluded by the sort of Ashkenazi centrism of some of the organizing that was happening, but they were still white people, you know, like functioning as white people in the US, if your ancestry is from Spain, or even like sometimes parts of the Middle East, when you come to the United States, there's a, there's an opportunity to assimilate into whiteness like any other group has been able to do. So um, we had to sort of like deal with the, the, these complexities and the in-betweeniness, um, but uh, that didn't really detract from the fact that we did have a shared experience of um, feeling excluded from who was being referred to when the word Jew was used, you know, um, and what traditions were in the room and being referenced. And I think um, for me being, you know, a, a Jew of color organizer for the, for the period that I was, was really about finding a more expansive way of conceptualizing all of these things um, that um, didn't reify the sort of very like uh, common boundaries of race and religion that we're used to sort of talking about when we talk about Jews. Um, maybe this is a, a good opportunity to start thinking a little bit about your historical perspective on Jewish affiliation with blackness or affiliation with whiteness. And I know this has come up maybe in, in everybody's work and everybody's discussions. What kinds of Jewish self-identifications with blackness have you found in, in different places and times and and what about the project of Jewish whiteness in different places in history? That is a very complicated question you have just asked. Uh, <laughs> it's complicated because I think the relationship historically between Jewishness and Blackness, at least in the United States, has been a very complicated one of both um, advocacy and at times appropriation. Um, um, seeming cultural affinity and at times needs to, to separate oneself from, from the taint of, of blackness, um, which in some ways is sort of a, a racial original sin in a place like the United States. Um, it's interesting because I think creatively, um, I often find myself um, looking at previous models um, of a sort of cultural affinity between Black people and Jewish people as a way of, of interacting with something that feels like a nascent Black and Jewish culture. To give you sort of an example, um, in the 1920s and 30s, there were these Yiddish poets who were describing the suffering of Black people in America in purely Yiddish terms, and purely Jewish terms rather, in cultural context as this sort of empathetic act of projection and solidarity. Now, of course, when you look back on this, 
it's hard not to consider all of the complicated registers at play, but for me, what if that affinity um, that the trajectories of Black and Jewish history have had for each other was pre predicated not on suffering, but on immense stores of joy, on resistance and resilience. There's so much potentially there that one as a Black Jew can simultaneously embody that I'm constantly inspired by that sort of as a historic example. And I think, you know, for me, the these sort of complexities of um, appropriation versus like, you know, genuine connection are something that uh, was like, I was sort of playing with at a young age. And I think for me hearing, like, for example, it's very common for J Jewish folks to sing, um, go down Moses at a Seder, right? As an adult, seeing a bunch of white Jewish people that kind of do that it will make me like cringe a little bit sometimes, but be being young and being in a mixed space, like, attending my, like, um, you know, a Seder where there were black and Jewish people present. That was something that was very, uh, you know, an experience of my identity is not something that has to be chopped up into little bits. Like this holiday is about everything about who I am. You know, like my family is not that far away generation, generationally from slavery. You know, my great grandfather was born a slave in Tennessee. And um, so for me celebrating a holiday like Passover um, was also a celebration of like, we really got free and not that long ago, you know? Um, at the same time, I think that sometimes the the identification that is natural, also like not to mention the fact that like a lot of black, you know, uh, cultural resistance and liberation theology is rooted in like the Exodus story, um, in like these sort of like historically you know Jewish narratives, um, and the there's there's of course like sharing across uh, communities through that, but also the sort of affinity that comes from that in some ways makes people. I think in the Jewish community, a little confused as to why people are trying to point to a difference between being black and being Jewish. Um, and which is not to say that that's like, obviously we're here, we're in the in-between right now. That's what this conversation is about, but also we can't pretend that like the history of this country has been the same for these two groups of people. And one thing I'm always trying to do in my work is recenter where we start talking about Jews and, and race in America, because the sort of normative story is about Ashkenazi immigration in the early 20th century. Um, and we leave out what happened in the antebellum South with, with the Jewish people. And there were of course like Jewish abolitionists, um, all over the country and people opposing the institution of slavery, but there were also people, you know, the largest Jewish community for a long time in the United States was in uh, Savannah, was in um, Charleston, excuse me. Also there were Jews in Savannah um, and they were owning slaves at a similar rate to their white Christian neighbors. And that's of course, you know, we have to be really clear that we're not gonna buy into anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about Jews orchestrating the slave trade, but there was Jewish participation in that. Um, and so some of this um, tendency to like use like black music, even if, it's, even if it's referencing a Jewish story without also acknowledging that like, that is referencing an oppression that some Jewish people were complicit in um, becomes a sort of, um, you know, an erasure of the complexity of, of our relationships. And I think that there's been many interesting and clever ways that people have played with that across, you know, time and the affinity between communities that came up, especially in that period of Ashkenazi immigration, when Jews were being really excluded from whiteness um, in a structural way when it came to like racially restrictive housing covenants, you know, access to certain like industries, um, Jews were like, you know, face widespread anti-Semitic um, like exclusion from a lot of different workplaces in the US. Um, I think that the places where people found solidarity in that um, are very interesting to me and the kind of um, things that makes it a little easier to like walk that line um, between these two, these two histories. Histor I'm thinking about, oh, please. Sorry, historically what I've been really sort of interested in lately, um, what I've been allowed to explore um, through a series that I'm, I've created for the Worker Circle um, has been this sort of contention that Jewish people in previous periods really had no particular opinion about Black people except in terms of appropriation or in racism. Um, the contents of that are actually much more complicated and more rich. It's occurred to me um, that previous generations of, of white Ashkenazi Jews who came to the United States had opinions and had engagement with the existence of Blackness because having an engagement with modernity in this country means having engagement with the reality of 
systemic oppression in the United States against Black people, and that Jews from the turn of the century on have had not only engagements with that, but a number of different thoughts and ways in which they dealt with that, um, ways in which they lengthened what the meaning of that was to their own existence in this country and their own existence as people who came from a history of systemic uh, racism and, and prejudice. So there are things there, especially historically, that are, are interesting. Um, and a lot of my work lately has been trying to sort of sift through that and pull those out and see what that means for us as we continue these conversations um, and dealing with these issues today. Um, I was thinking about Rebecca's film about the Black Panther movement in Israel. Uh, and, and of course about Anthony's last event at the Worker Circle. Um, so the, in, in that film, we have a group of people identifying with Blackness to the point of calling themselves the Black Panther Party. And we also have a protest sign in Hebrew that says, Golda, teach us Yiddish. Um, and so maybe if you could briefly reflect on that and also on the role of Yiddish for both of you um, as perhaps some kind of expression of your identity as a Black and Jewish person. So just to be very clear about um, how Blackness is referred to in, in that film, um, in the early days of the State of Israel, which was founded primarily by Ashkenazi Jews from Europe, you know, Mizrahi immigration from um, Arab and Muslim majority countries um, to the state brought in people who were, you know, culturally very different than Ashkenazi Jews in a lot of ways, and in some cases more culturally um, similar to Palestinians. And so there was a need to sort of like um, divide between them and Palestinians and divide between them and Ashkenazi Jews. And the terminology that would be used for people, and this was not something they, they initially adopted themselves, but was sort of imposed, were terms like Oriental or Black. Um, and so if you're being called that every day, whether if you're from like Iraq or Morocco and maybe wouldn't normally be included in what we what we assume as, as blackness, although I don't wanna make a blanket st statement about that, but like um, that's still something that's internalized into your identity or becomes over time. And it becomes something that like, you're not gonna accept as an insult, but you're gonna like take for yourself and sort of um, use as an empowering term. And so, for them, the Black Panther Party in the U.S. was very influential in this period when the when the um, Israeli Black Panthers were forming, um, and that referring to them as Black was contrasting them to Ashkenazi Jewry. And in, in the case of the Golda Teaches Yiddish sign, that was a reference to Golda Meir speaking about a group of um, Olim. I'm not sure. I don't remember where exactly they were coming from, but they were like Ashkenazi Jews. And she said these are like the good immigrants that we want in Israel, and they're Yiddish speakers. And so. Um, the Black Panther Party, the Israeli Black Panther Party, being very like cheeky, you know, youth organizers, uh, created these signs that said like, "Golda, teach us Yiddish, so we can be like the good immigrants that you want." Um, and I think that speaks to a particular dynamic in Israel. And it's not that Yiddish is super like celebrated necessarily in in Israel. It's a, a uh, was in many ways repressed from becoming the national language, right? Um, in lieu of Hebrew. But um, in that particular case, it, it became, in this particular conversation, it became a, a symbol, right? An important symbol about um, how one culture is being sort of elevated over, over another. Um, for me, my relationship to Yiddish is a, a completely sort of separate thing. It's coming from my um, being an, a Black Ashkenazi Jew in the United States. And I think um, one of the things that, actually I have to credit Anthony um, a lot, uh, one of the things that made that sort of an exciting thing for me to explore was to see these sort of like historic and um, interesting cultural relationships that come up with Yiddish. Um, I'm a really big fan of like Black Americana music and like roots music. And um, one thing that I was super curious about was uh, Rhiannon Giddens, who used to be in the Carolina Chocolate Drops, um, does a version of Underneath the Harlem Moon, um, which was a uh, what was referred to as coon music, a uh, um, song that Black singers would perform for white audiences that was popularized by Ethel Waters. And in the Ethel Waters version, you know, this is a very like originally a kind of a racist song that she rewrote to be more about like her pride in being black. Um, and there's a line in the song that was originally like, this is why we darkies were born. And she changed it to this is why we schwarzes were born. 
And the reason for that was because she would often perform in Yiddish for Yiddish speaking audiences. And their sort of pet name for her, which is in some ways pejorative in other ways, sort of like, you know, expression of their excitement that she was coming to sing for them was their schwarze. So she replaced this pejorative, the English pejorative with a Yiddish one as a way of sort of reclaiming her relationship to her music as a performer. And so for me, as someone who's studying Yiddish, that's not the only reason I study Yiddish. I study it because it's a language that my ancestors spoke that is accessible to me. But I'm very interested and curious in these sort of collisions between Blackness and Jewishness, and they're complicated, they're messy, and they need to be contextualized. Um, but they're there. And like, there's Yiddish in Black music, Black historical music that's worth studying if you want to understand Black culture. Um I want to contextualize whatever Anthony's response is going to be by saying that um, Anthony, uh, to my mind, is one of the most important voices, literally and figuratively, in Yiddish culture today, uh, and somebody that I often look to for an understanding of what's going on in contemporary Yiddish culture, and, and has also recently turned even more um, from just artistic creation to, to other aspects of engagement with Yiddish. So uh, including your, your work on um, Black Lives Matter terminology in Yiddish and the article that you drafted me <laughs> into uh, about the protests last summer that we wrote in Yiddish and, and your project at the Worker Circle right now. So um, can you reflect on a little bit what what you're doing and what it means to you with Yiddish. And then maybe I, I hope we'll have some time before the Q&A to think about diaspora. Well, it, it's funny, that's exactly what I wanted to talk about. A part of my engagement with Yiddish is a reclamation of my identity as a, as a Jew of the diaspora. Yiddish is one of many diasporic languages. And as a Jew who is, um, of the Jewish diaspora, who lives in the Jewish diaspora, who's an exponent of, of the Jewish diaspora culturally and otherwise, I think it behooves me to be able to learn how to express myself in a diasporic language for that to support my existence as, as a diasporic Jew. And I really try to use Yiddish in that fashion as a medium of self-expression of myself uh, as a diaspora Jew. I mean, it's funny in consideration of the fact that like, um, you know, kind of the touchdown of my formal education, the language happened in Israel at Tel Aviv University. But even then I was able to take uh, what I learned there and enrich the, the culture making that I do here, um, you know, with that education that I received there. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what you asked me, Sarah, um, because I think I, I did it backwards. You said we should end with diaspora, and I started with diaspora, that's, but they're, they're all very much fine. combined for me. We had we had spoken earlier about um, about, for example, a term that didn't come up, but I believe is in currency right now, Ashkenormativity, normativity. Perhaps it did come up, um, or you know, the way that maybe that an Ashkenazi identity can can seem sort of overwhelming and marginalizing in some ways, but at the same time, how you can be a Jew of color with an Ashkenazi identity, where does Yiddish maybe fit into that? We had this example from Israel of where, how Yiddish is, is associated with hegemony uh, to the Black Panthers. And then, um, and we also see Yiddish as a kind of resistance as Jordan Kutzik, I think had put it that, um, that maybe Ashkenazi normativity, as we understand it, also marginalizes Yiddish. Um, but but where do you stand with with your work as a Yiddish artist? I know that's a lot to say because that's so much of what you do. It's been interesting because I've started to posit myself, if not exactly a critic of the concept of Ashkenazi normativity, somebody who really tries to delineate what are the contents of the phenomenon that we call Ashkenazi normativity. I think um, oftentimes in trying to figure out exactly what that is in order to address systemic issues in mainstream American Jewish culture and the way in which that is performed. Um, there isn't an acknowledgement of the fact that a lot of it is specifically a, a sort of parochial 
American Jewish culture, which does not really possess any sort of um, specificities of things that one would encounter in one's travels through the contents of Ashkenazi Jewish culture. It's American Jewish culture that happens to be Ashkenazi in orientation and Ashkenazi in flavor, but does that mean that there's something inherently problematic with Ashkenazi culture? I don't think so. Is there something inherently problematic with the mainstream contents of, of, of a sort of flat mass cult of, of you know, American Jewish culture? There's some issues there. Um, and some of those issues look like something that could be called Ashkenormativity, but I think um, the performance of American Ashkenazi Jewish culture is much flatter and much more Americanized than the actual specific contents, the diverse contents, if I can be honest, of what Ashkenazi Jewish culture is and potentially could be. That always, I know that always strikes people as very strange because the idea is that, you know, they see all of this and they're like, okay, so he's going to be absolutely on the forefront of, of the fight against Ashkenormativity. And I am, I'm, in, I'm on the forefront of a fight against racism in American Jewish spaces and assumptions of how people should be and how people should act and what their frame of references should be. I am a culture and language maximalist. I don't want less culture and I don't want less language. I don't want one language. I want as many language and as much culture as I could possibly get. I want to have a real physical experience of the diversity of, of the Jewish people. And that includes me as a black person. I bring my ways of being black into those spaces with the expectation that they're going to met, be met with everybody else's nuanced and diverse contents of their Jewishness as well. We need to create American spaces where this can actually happen and where everything isn't taken for granted that it's going to be this ersatz version of Ashkenazi American identity that everyone's gonna sign up for and anything that falls outside of those parameters, which includes Ashkenazi culture to, to, to you know, to admit to a, a certain degree is, is something that we have, wanna have nothing to do with. Um, Rebecca, I don't know if you wanted to respond to that, but uh, do, and if you do, um, please, please do. I wonder while we have just a couple of minutes left before the Q&A, starting to think about diaspora and Yiddish as a diasporic language. And I think yesterday you mentioned um, some of the reasons why Yiddish as a diasporic language spoke to you. Mm -hmm. um, also, maybe to bring in at this point, Point, the Ugandan Jewish community. I want to remind everyone that our speakers today are, are speaking from their own unique experience. Um, and Rebecca is somebody who can tell us a little bit more about the diversity of, of Black and Jewish identity. Yeah, so I, I had a, some opportunity to work with a few different, you know, Black people, of like lots of different Black Jewish backgrounds, whether it be Ethiopian, Israelis, um, one thing that I've been researching lately and, and working to write about a little bit is the exclusion of Ugandan um, Jews recently from like status of being able to immigrate to Israel. And there's a lot of like important political questions that are uh, wrapped up in this, but really the um, basically the, the bottom line was that, you know, there's a, a Jewish community in Uganda that um, has its own, it's, it's referred to as, uh, as what's called a, an emerging Jewish community. So these are people who um, have their own sort of relationship to Judaism that is not necessarily um, like rabbinic, like historically rooted in rabbinic Judaism, although that is changing for this community. Um, and uh, in the case of like Israel, they're not recognized by um, the government as Jewish for purposes of immigration. And that was a, re a recent decision that was made. It's, it's currently being contested. While that's happening, many um, diaspora Jewish movements are in relationship with this community. Like the conservative movement does conversions in this community, which we can talk about the complexity of whether or not that's necessary. I'm not sure that someone has to co convert to conservative Judaism to be considered a Jew, but this is like part of the relationship and, and that's something that this community views as positive. Um, they are building schools in these communities so that people can um, you know, study Hebrew. The reform movement is also active, but um, there's, a, there's a conflict between the really like diaspora and the Israeli government right now over who is Jewish and blackness is not, cannot really be separated from that conversation. There are like many Jewish groups that have been able to immigrate to Israel while 
practicing or not practicing forms of Judaism that are different from like the sort of normative um, Orthodox Judaism that is the Israeli state Judaism, right? Um, and racial ex exclusion as part of that was also part of the, you know, what happened to Ethiopian Jews who were forced in many cases to give up traditional practices. There are a traditional priesthood that was practiced that's older than rabbinic Judaism um, in order to make Aliyah. And I think it, it does speak to like, even as like many people on the right will protest, even talking about the fact that there are Jews of color, um, there are legal structures between Jews that are that are that are uh, discriminating between Jews in this way um, on the basis of race and religious practice. And if you know Israel supposedly is, um, recognizes um, conservative confer conversion, why if, like like why are Ugandan Jews being denied status on the like on the basis that their their conversion somehow isn't valid? Um, and it really speaks to, first of all, the political question of a Jewish state, which is how do you define, how do you give out rights? And if you're giving out rights to people who you determine to be Jewish, how do you determine who is Jewish? And it, why or why is not race part of that conversation? And I think um, for me, it also speaks to like why we can't really wholly separate issues of racism in the Jewish community from the fact that like there is massive ex like exclusion and racist laws excluding Palestinians as well on the basis of they're not fitting into these categories because the categories that are being now imposed on people or people are being excluded from were created to differentiate on this like sort of demographic basis. I don't know if that quite answers your question, but I'm, this is kind of what I'm thinking about a lot. And as someone who is in the black diaspora and the Jewish diaspora, I feel a very strong sense of responsibility to every community who is in either of those and also especially the people who are in both, um, which is why I'm you know, trying to research and speak up on this issue and say like, we as American Jews sort of have to figure out where we um, where we stand and how we feel about this because it's very hard. How are you gonna say you're in solidarity um, with this group of people and then continue to like um, allow structures that are discriminating against them to define who is Jewish, you know, for, for the rest of us. We have covered very quickly a lot of ground. Thank you for, for that. Um, and it's not the end of our conversation. So perhaps important questions that I missed or things that you feel you didn't have a chance to answer, we can now hear from the Q&A from all the people who've been watching and they'll have a chance to ask you questions. And um, if there's something that you feel you still didn't answer, maybe you'll have a chance in the course of the Q&A. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Anthony and Rebecca and Sarah for this um, really boundary pushing <laughs> present um, conversation. And we're going to take a few questions from the audience, which I have here. Um, my habit is to, oh, by the way, I'm Abby Wolf from the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. Apologies for not introducing myself. Um, my habit is to combine questions a little bit as much as I can so we can get to many of them. We may not get to all of them. I'll tell the audience that right now because we do have quite a few, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, the first question, I mean, one way that, um, that I've long thought about the issue of Black Jewish identity is it, is it exists at the, at the intersection of a visible identity and what could be considered an invisible identity. So an identity that can be seen and an identity that needs to be articulated in some way. Well, um, in, a, in, in a sense, yeah. an identity that, you know, through a long process of, of assimilation into American whiteness has become invisible. Mm. Yes, thank that's, you put it much better than I did. Um, one of our um, audience members, Hakeem Walker, says this question is mostly directed at Anthony, but I would open it up to you, Rebecca, because after you've um, discussed your own experiences, um, in different spaces. Since, since your black identity is more readily apparent to people than your Jewish identity, and thus more readily ascribed to you, has this affected how you view your own identity? And he says, for example, do you think of yourself as black first? In increasingly, I think of myself as myself. I know that sounds a little bit of mm -hmm. like, a, like a cop out. Mm -hmm. um, 
Huh. I mean, you know, given that I am a convert to Judaism, uh, um, I believe recently it's like my 10 year anniversary of my formal conversion to Judaism. Um, I am certainly used to thinking of myself as black because I've been doing that for the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for the, for, you know, most of my life. Um, I don't generally think of myself in terms of one first and then the other, mm -hmm. um, unless I'm in places in which people are specifically trying to separate the two. Mm -hmm. um, and then I really try to embody both mm -hmm. at the same time and I have ways of doing that, which are very complicated. And I can't exactly explain here. One of the ways in which I do that, of course, is through my work in which I'm specifically inhabiting a black Jewish space and creating sounds that only make sense in a black Jewish context. So that is a way in which I can um, transmit, I can externalize like that combined identity. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very complicated question. I mean, it's completely, um, it's predicated on, on, on what the particular interaction with other people happen to be. As I see myself, I see myself as a black Jewish person. I see myself as a black person. I see myself as a Jewish person. Sometimes there's or, um, particular circumstances under which I might see myself as primarily black, but that's because to some degree I'm seeing myself reflected back to myself as someone who's primarily black and a Jewish person isn't there. It's, it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, do you want to take that question too? It's interesting because for me, these are not, um, they're inseparable actually, like in a lot of ways. And the way I come about my identity is I, a lot of things that I think make me Jewish, I actually got from my mom, who's a black Christian woman, mm -hmm. uh, a love of Leonard Cohen, um, you know, so, uh, relationships to Jewish theater and, you know, and um, histories of that I learned about from her. Um, and my dad was the one who taught me about the blues and African music, um, which is something I do in my, my spare time. So um, these are not like two separable things for me, but I think it is interesting that I become black first uh, mm -hmm. under the lens of white supremacy in the Jewish community, it doesn't matter. Um, and you know, and I'm obviously like, I'm like a very light skinned black person. I have a lot of privilege that comes from that. But at the end of the day, like I'm still getting these comments about you know, uh, recently I was like targeted for some anti-Black harassment from my fellow Jews and the comments were all about the shape of my nose and my lips. And it comes down to like this very basic old ancient anti-Black racism. Mm -hmm. And it, um, the idea that I'm motivated by anger or hate towards the Jewish community when I talk about race. It, it, so I become Black first in their eyes. And of course, it's because I refuse to become Black second, really, because I refuse to, to put that outside of the room for the comfort of people who are benefiting from racism. And I think that like, and in the black community, I do sometimes get questions about how I see myself and it, it comes down to sort of like prove yourself to me either way. And at the end of the day, I realized that I can't, I can only just be myself. And for me, that is black and Jewish all at the same time, all at once, all bound together. And I'm happy that way, you know? That's great. Thank you. I'm glad you answered that question too, that you both took that question. Um, you've both referred to your families quite a bit during this conversation. Um, and one of our attendees is asking you to talk a bit about how your own elders and others in older generations respond to the work you're doing and to the progressive, the progression of your thinking and action. Um, Rebecca, do you want to take that one first? Or sure. Wait, I can't see Anthony. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we talked about this a little bit last year. Um, actually, we, this weekend was our last weekend was the my grandfather's first yard site. Um, my uh, Jewish grandfather on my paternal side of the family passed away this time last year. And one of my sort of regrets was the fact that I didn't always feel comfortable talking to him about my work, especially as it pertains to Palestinian rights, because he grew up, he was alive when the Holocaust happened in the United States. Um, and his conception of Israel, for example, is one that's very, um, you know, rooted in that history. And so when I'm being critical of that um, or the, the policies of the state, it caused a lot of, of um, strife, but um, he's also very proud when I did my Israeli Black Panther documentary, even though that film is also criticizing the state and very, you know, if you listen to Reuven Aberdell, he's very pointed when he talks about these things. Um, on the Black side of my family, my work has actually brought me closer to my um, Muslim relatives in a lot of ways. Um, at the same time that my grandfather passed, we were also losing my auntie, Sarah Muhammad, who was a black Muslim woman. Um, and 
I just remember when I came back from Palestine, I'd always bring her, Israel and Palestine, I always bring her something um, from Jerusalem because that was really special to her. And we would sort of bond over the outsiderness of being um, non-Christians in the Jewish, uh, sorry, in the black community. Oh, sorry, I'm getting emotional. But um, the process of, you know, me becoming who I am has a lot to do with both of these people. Mm -hmm. And that's not a contradiction at all. And, um, you know, I know that like, at the end, uh, there was, even though there was like conflict in certain spaces, there was also a lot of pride. Mm -hmm. And, um, and also in practicing this very Jewish practice of argument, you know. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you for that really um, candid response. So Anthony, what about you? In terms of family, I often think about myself as an exponent of certain continuities between myself and ways of being a member of my family in the world. My grandfather um, has been a, a deacon in the Church of Christ since he was very since he was young and has always been a literal voice in the church as, as a singer, a bass singer, as I am myself. Um, and because of, because of this, I often think about myself as almost being a version of him in a specifically Jewish context. And I feel very comfortable in that because I feel like I am being uh, this sort of person after a certain fashion in the mold of, of my ancestors as religious people, as black religious people, but that is happening in, in the context of of Jewish religion or Jewish religiosity, I don't feel any sort of loss of myself or any loss of connection with my family by adopting the Jewish religion. If anything, I feel like I'm realizing um, certain aspects of who they are through through my Judaism, and it makes me feel very connected to them, mm -hmm. um, connected to that tradition. The Church of Christ in particular has this practice where they don't have any musical instruments in the church. Um, this is um, almost the same practice that a number of Orthodox and conservative congregations have. So when I ended up in Jewish spaces in which there were no instruments, I felt very comfortable um, with the, the kind of music making that had to happen in order to make musical praying hang together. Mm -hmm. I was familiar with that and I had a familial experience of that. I'd like to think, an, you know, an ethnic memory of that, that I was able to take with me into the boundaries of, of Jewish religious space and I could fully sort of inhabit that part of myself there. Mm -hmm. Be that's beautiful. And yesterday, um, when we had a chance to speak, you used a phrase that I wanted, I jotted down a lot of things yesterday too. You're both very quotable. Um, but one thing that you said unites the black community and Jewish community is the ability to hold on to one's soul as part of being both black and Jewish. And I feel like that's very much what you're talking about is this kind of unifying principle in your, in your own lives. Um, Here's a question, um, Sandra Chiritescu, who has a few questions here, but this one is interesting. A, co a colleague of, 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 oh. of ours is a, y a Yiddish person, so. Okay. Hi, Sandra. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad I, I chose her question, one of her questions then. Um, she's asking um, if you have, and, and this goes to that, I think the larger question of Jews of color, as you were talking about it, as communities of or being made up of individuals who have been marginalized in some in some way um she says any thoughts on gender as it intersects with black jewish identities any thoughts on navigating certain spaces as a black jewish woman versus a black jewish man so who wants that <laughs> i mean i can just speak to like there's a certain level of like vitriol that in response to, sorry, my like lighting situation is a little awkward right now. So if you see me changing color, that's why. Um, the, to like women on the internet. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, so for me speaking out on these issues of race in the Jewish community, I'll get a certain level of targeting that um, responds to that. There's another on the positive end though, I have so much black feminist and womanist 
um, history and Jewish feminist history um, to pull from. And in studying Yiddish, that's actually been quite poignant for me. And as someone who's a filmmaker working in this like very male dominated industry, reading and like learning through the Helix Fellowship about um, what happened to like, like Yiddish women writers really resonates with me as a, as a Black woman and you know, a woman in film who has to experience that sort of like degradation and sometimes marginalization from your peers. There's so much um, both like tragedy and also history to learn from in these different um, traditions that I can speak to. And I have to say like the people who have my back the most in the world are other black Jewish women, like, mm -hmm. um, or other black Jewish queer folks um, in the spaces that I'm in. And um, so there, that's always like gonna be in the room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's really complicated in, in my case because of any number of dynamics that are at play all at once. You know, the, the black male body is coded as being a source of danger in the United States. So its inclusion in a mainstream Jewish space is always anomalous. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes um, I have to directly interact with, with that fact that you know black bodies in an american mainstream jewish space are anomalous unless they're serving a very particular function sometimes what i'm doing in those spaces falls within that function um which is a cultural function sometimes um you know black men you know in a way are, are sort of considered to be distillers or disseminators of aspects of jewish culture and i mean popularly um you know, we have the American songbook. <laughs> Black women as well, actually, are sort of considered to be sort of disseminators of certain certain aspects of, of culture that was produced by Jews. And sometimes when I'm in Jewish space, it's expected that that's what I'm going to do. Um, and sometimes I have to fight against that. Sometimes I just want to be there and just be myself and not have to have all of this baggage attached to me um, or expectation as to what I'm going to be as, you know, as a Black man in that given space. Um, so it, it's complicated. It, it, it's, it's definitely an issue. Mm -hmm. I do remember um, one time during one of the very first performances that I ever gave in the Yiddish language in, in Toronto, um, after giving an hour long concert, um, a white Ashkenazi Jewish woman of a certain age came up and said, are you single? And I said, yes. <laughs> Oh, wait, I didn't say yes, actually, because I had a boyfriend at the time, but she, she said, are you single? I said, no. She said, that's too bad because, you know, my niece needs a good, strong Jewish man. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> but okay, I guess. <laughs> that Unfortunately, that's not the issue. The Jewishness was not the issue, but rather, uh, you know, that I was not an option for her niece as far as being a partner was concerned. I thought that was obvious from the stage, but I guess not. <laughs> um, there are so many questions. I'm having trouble um, getting through all of them. A few, you know, I think um, if you don't, there are questions asking about kind of your advice for how Jewish communities in particular can move forward um, and, and move forward from this moment of recognition um, of white privilege, white, you know, of white Jews implication in white supremacy, white benefits from it, um, how, how Jewish communities can move forward into um, real meaningful work um, for racial justice. Um, and then it, so if you could address that, I mean, I don't know if you're in the business of prescribing solutions, but I think a lot of people in the audience are interested to hear your thoughts on that. There are many, many questions <laughs> in that regard, so. I'm heartened by the desire of people in the audience to want to do that, but I also would like to address the fact that being a Black Jew means often being looked to as leadership for these kinds of issues, whether you decide you really want to do that or not. So I'm sure between the two of us, we have a few things to say as far as that's concerned. As far as I'm concerned, what I would like American Jewish communities to consider is if there aren't people of color in your communities, if that was actually by design, mm -hmm. um, and if there are people of color who are in your communities, do you know anything about the material nature of, of their lives? You know, it's one thing 
this goes back to something that you said, Rebecca. It's one thing to sit down around um, a Seder table and sing, go down Moses, and feel like, and to some degree, you have fulfilled one of the mitzvahs of the Seder. You've told the, the Passover story. But if you don't have a concept of actually what is the nature of the lives of black people and people of color in your own neighborhood, in your own communities, then what's the point of bringing their music in in order to celebrate, you know, a, a holiday of freedom? It's a mockery. So what I would invite people to do is to really become familiar with what is happening in your neighborhood, what is going on with the people of color in your community, in your Jewish community, and in, in, in your greater community. Have a engagement with that. And if you find things there that you don't like, come together and do something about it. I don't want to get too anecdotal, but I, I used to work as a Jewish educator. Um, I used to teach um, B'nai Mitzvah children. And the amount of organization that I would see every year that parents would manage to do around making sure that their class would have, you know, the best experience that they could possibly have. They would have, you know, um, tikkun olam projects and they would have trips. There's just amazing amounts of communal organization the communal organization that American Jewish community is, is built on can be used in order to create justice in our communities, and it should be. And just, you know, going a little bit off of that, there are initiatives that are like currently being brought forward uh, to that end. Mm -hmm. Not Free to Desist is one, it's a letter with a number of um, sort of obligations that Jewish communal organizations can undertake to better include Jews of color, everywhere from leadership to, to where money goes, who's making decisions about funding um, and programming and things of that nature. I think that that is a really useful tool for if you're thinking, what can I do about my synagogue, right? Um, I know my, like the uh, congregation that I'm part of um, in the San Francisco Bay area is doing a lot of reading uh, groups and um, work for like white Jewish folks while also creating affinity groups for people of color in the community. Because like reformed Jews, we also have, uh, we have Jews of color and then we have people who are part of the Jewish, who are part of our community who aren't necessarily Jewish, but are people of color. So like finding spaces to, to be inclusive towards them, mm -hmm. having those difficult conversations about like police and synagogues is another thing that I think a lot of um, black Jews have been raising and that um, something that, you know, of course we need safety. We're under threat from white supremacists all the time. Um, but also like, how do we make that safety be safety for everyone, including people who've experienced targeting by the police. Um, another thing I think that is really important is to recognize recognize the way in which Black people and also Arab Americans and Palestinians are sort of used as a trigger um, to like in, to sort of upset Jewish people to, um, you know, by like the by right wing voices and to recognize that when you hear certain rhetoric around, around Black Lives Matter that's sort of meant to scare people and to make people feel unsafe, it's really important to explore what's rhetoric, what's real, like what real differences are coming up and what is maybe something that's a disagreement but not an actual threat to your safety. Um, and I think that I've seen a lot of things where like people will talk about Black Lives Matter having a relationship with Palestinians and that becomes a sort of scare tactic to not support the movement. Um, and that's something that we actually need to really start to address because it makes it so much harder for Jews of color, for black Jews to talk about racism in the community. But anytime I say anything about that, I get, what about BLM being pro-Palestinian? What does that have to do with this? Like really? And if you want to like, and if you know me, you'll know that I don't actually have a problem with like Palestine solidarity. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the way in which we're used as a wedge against each other needs to be addressed. And that doesn't mean we can't have conflict. We always will. It's like, we're humans and we're Jews. We like to argue. So, mm -hmm. you know, just, but it's like about embracing that conflict and discomfort um, and being a little bit more able to tell when we're kind of being manipulated. Cause I think that that, that happens, you know? That's, you just, Anthony, do you want to say something? Yes, yeah, just really quickly. Um, I've addressed this elsewhere and I guess I'll address it here. Um, Oftentimes, Black Jews and Jews of color are, are brought into mainstream Jewish spaces or Jewish communal spaces um, and sort of tokenized. Um, they're brought in to sort of present themselves, and then once that presentation has happened, they're kind of shunted off to the side, and somebody somewhere has a clipboard where they, where they check off, you know, we've done the diversity thing and now we're done. What I would invite people to do in your Jewish communities and elsewhere is to consider making a long-term arrangement 
um, with people who do things in, with black people and Jews of color who do things in Jewish community. Because we already know what it looks like to make a long-term engagement with somebody who does something in Jewish community because it happens with white Jews all of the time. Maybe next time you might want to consider considering a black Jew or a Jew of color and taking that same amount of investment in them and in your community as you would otherwise. You just both answered multiple other questions that were asked. So, I, I, I want to uh, say really quickly that like actually Harvard here is modeling that to some degree in the sense that this is not the only program of this kind, but you actually have a series. You have more than one program. Mm -hmm. Keep on doing that. We are we're <laughs> kind of going into next year and, you know, open up different topics. And um, we're really excited about that. It's been a goal of both centers for some time now. Um, one final question, and then we will wrap up. Um, uh, one of our attendees says, you are both artists who I see directly interweave your experiences into your work at all times. You live with your research and creativity, creativity daily, and perhaps even when you sleep. What are the ways you renew yourselves in order not to, burn, to not burn out and or give, or give up? what keeps you going? And I would say, I mean, I want to say, I know that um, you just mentioned this, you know, that black Jews are often, you know, kind of yoked into a position of leadership on these questions. And I want to acknowledge that, that that's, you know, that is certainly true. And I think that's what this question is getting at too. Like, how do you, what does renew you? What gets you past the exhaustion you might feel sometimes? Well, we're Jews, so Shabbat is, a, is like the, the, one of the is a very important thing for me. Um, I actually like uh, I have a personal policy of I'm not dealing with racist BS on Shabbat, <laughs> um, and uh, sometimes it's impossible to avoid because you'll go to the synagogue and you'll hear something, right? Mm -hmm. But um, that has been really important. And I think also just community is and art. Um, and other people's art and enjoying that. And I think, you know, I'm in a lot of like black Jewish group chats and what we be like venting to each other. And, you know, just like, uh, what's something that comes up? I have people I can turn to who are like me and who have had my experiences and that's so important. And um, music is a huge part of my life. You know, I don't talk about it as much because it's sort of more of my personal art, but I, I um, put a lot of the struggles that I have into music and playwriting and um, I do sketch comedy, like, I, yeah, like other forms of art. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically playing guitar and doing um, blues music uh, is, is a huge form of that. And I've been begun to incorporate Jewish themes into that, which is really mm -hmm. fun and easy because of the, the cultural language we share. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, it's interesting that you said uh, Shabbos, Rebecca, because I think actually intentionally taking time to stop creating and to sort of reconnect with oneself and to reconnect with one's community is one of the best ways in which I I find the ability to, to kind of move on. Uh, connecting with Black community, connecting with Black Jewish community is really important. It's always um, a regenerating experience, an inspirational experience. Um, for me, uh, connecting with a community of, of creators, um, both Black and Jewish creators, um, and having the ability to feel joy and pride at the continuities between the work that, their work that I experience and my own work really feeling like I'm a part of a movement of people who are emboldened and embodied in, in their expression. Like those are the things that, that, I, that I do in order to, to you know, really regenerate myself mm -hmm. um, and my work. Well, I think in closing, um, there's so much more to talk about, but that seems like a beautiful point to end on. And I just want to, on behalf of everyone in the audience, um, behalf of, on behalf of everyone at the Hutchins Center and the Center for Jewish Studies, I want to thank both of you for sharing your work and your brilliance and your um, thoughts and, and for pushing us, for pushing everyone in this audience to, to do better and think better and think more. So um, thank you so much. As, as Anthony plugged already, we're continuing this series. So our next installment will be on a month from today, March 22nd, um, a conversation between Michael Twitty and Tema Smith. And we'll be sending out more information on that. That should be 
a lot of fun. Um, we love them, by the way. They are great. They're people. good friends of both of us. Yeah, yes, they are, <laughs> and real innovators in this sort of con this space of Black you. Jewishness. It's great. Maybe we'll see you in the audience on that day. But um, but anyway, I do just want to thank you and to hope that we all leave this continuing this conversation in our own families, our communities, our institutions, and join us again on March 22nd. So thank you so much and good night, everyone.